everybody, Mark Edwards here, along with Jerome Berube and Brad Allen. And today we're going to do a short podcast answering some questions that we've received through Twitter, through our website, and uh, on an online forum, uh, HF Boards. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, a common question, and that is the Carlson versus Fantilli, since we have Carlson at number two, and I don't know about you guys, I haven't seen another list out there that has Carlson at number two, so we're kind of uh, on our own here. So if just real quickly, I just it, a flashback to the Stutzla versus Byfield year. And in the hockey sense area, we had uh, Stutzla with the higher hockey sense and that being an area of weakness for Byfield. And it's similar for, for Fantilli this year. So just really quick, you know, assessment there uh, of something that um, it reminded of us. And, and even back to the, uh, uh, Taylor versus Tyler year. Um, Brad, you want to expand on your thoughts on this at all? Sure. I think um, it starts with if you believe until he's a center or not, right? So we we think he's more of a winger, and we feel pretty validated based off the fact that we thought this before what we saw at the World Championships relative to seeing Leo Carlson, right? Like Leo was on the wing in the SHL. Um, for the entire season. And so we didn't get many opportunities to actually see him play center until the Worlds, where we felt he peaked and definitely looked like the natural center we expected. And then with Adam Fentili, the, the problem with projecting him as a center is that centers need to be able to anticipate the play usually two steps ahead. If you really want to put them in the top six and know that they can anticipate play well enough to stay in front of other opposing teams. Um, and, and that's where Fentili for us, we think falls short. Um, it's one of those situations where he does a lot of reacting without as much reading as Carlson. And so that works for college hockey. It's fine at the U20 level. It's not going to be fine when he was assessed at the NHL level. The other enormous difference for us relative to what you see publicly is that there's a lot of people who think that Adam Fantilli's playmaking skill set is similar to Leo Carlson's. We don't. I think Leo Carlson is a vastly superior playmaker. I think his playmaking windows are better. His leading passes are better. He's a better technical playmaker. Uh, there's more nonce to him. He understands how to use, uh, despite being the bigger player, he understands how to incorporate deception within his first phase better than Adam Fentile. And that's, those are the, the real strengths for us. And when you look at Fentile, better competitor, better shooter, but ultimately we think aware. So those would be, that's how I would sum up the debate. Yeah, and just going back to the way I started this with the Stutzla versus Byfield, I guess I want to be clear here. We we are all in agreement that he is Fantilli is a better player than Byfield at the same age. Um, for us, we weren't really team Byfield. He was a good prospect, but probably didn't like him as much as uh, most people. Um, and we just think Fantilli, although in our opinion the weakness is in the same area in that hockey sense, he is still in the other areas probably better in just about every other area. Jerome, you want to just chime in and, and finish this off? Any th quick thoughts? Well, I mean, if you look at their skill level, it's, you, get, you can make an argument it's somewhat close. Um, but if you look at our ratings in the black book for Akisans, you know, there's a big there's, there's a big difference between the two of them. So, like, as far as, like, ranking them, like, it, it was not much of a debate for us like uh Carlson gets a eight rating for hockey sense and you know Fentili gets a five rating so at the end of the day like it's, it was a pretty easy ranking for us to to make at the end with you know if we, and we value hockey sense like it's the number one thing we value so it was a bit of a no-brainer at the end for us yeah and just for people that have not seen our black book and don't know about our rating scale we use a three to nine scale. So five would be average, nine elite, three poor. And then there's, you know, different names for the numbers in between. Uh, six is good, seven very good, eight excellent. Okay, and then uh, four would be below average. So when you hear, if we mention anywhere else here where we, we give a grade, uh, it's not out of 10, it's a, it's a three to nine scale. And, and Fantilli's was graded as average hockey sense. Carlson's was an eight which comes in uh, excellent, just short of elite. Uh, next question, and this came from HF Boards. Uh, there was uh, a user there that wanted to know about a few goalies. 
So this one's going to go to Brad to do a quick overview on some guys. Um, Scott Ratzliff, Stephen Pack, uh, Yatoka, and who's the last one? Uh, Alexer, Ale Alexander uh, Hendley. Hell name. Hell name. Yeah, he has, a, he has a weird name. Um, yeah, so so I'll start with Peck, just saying that we didn't see him. Uh, there was not many opportunities to really evaluate the player, and that's the reason he was left off. The others, however, I did get to see a lot of. So I'll start with the most interesting one of the three, and that's uh, Scott Ratzlaff. Uh, Ratzlaff is in a situation I don't like him to be in. So, so he was on a very dominant team in Seattle in the WHL. I really dislike having to, to – uh, evaluate first year eligible goalies coming from elite teams because what happens is you usually deal with more low danger chances per 60 relative to high danger than if he was on an average team or even a bad team like Crabble was this past season in Omaha system. So that's the first thing is there's a bit of a discomfort there. The, the other aspect is that I really like his tracking. I think if you look at it from the from a hockey sense perspective, he's somebody who anticipates play well. He's very good at making uh, small area adjustments and recognizing the highest danger threat. He scans the ice uh, well. He knows how to time his scans, uh, despite being a younger goalie. The problem for us, and um, this this is this is we've we've always um, been a staff that appreciates a smaller goalie. Scott Ratzlaff stands about six feet tall, six and a half feet tall. The problem is there has to be a minimum threshold they reach from an athletic perspective in order to think they at least hit a 1B. Scott Rasslaff for us falls under that. That's the real issue. That's the reason I never ended up writing him because when you look at it, so Jerome, Jerome was the first person who ever came to me discussing Devin Levi. A couple of years back, he was saying how, how impressed he was, couldn't believe his ability at the size, right? Uh, so you know, Jerome was really adamant about Devin Levi. And then you see the athletic ability, the reflexes, the coordination, the extension rates. Though That's the, the, the base, right? Uh, you look further back, you see Saros as a perfect example of what we really want to see in a smaller goalie. Dustin Wolf, who we also ranked in our top four. Uh, I remember telling Mark when he was 16, watch out for this kid. This is the real deal. So it's not that we're against small goalies. But they have to be at least Alexei Kolosov in their initial draft season for us to really matter. And we felt that Scott Ratzlaff was just under that, despite being impressive. I, I don't dislike him. I think he's a good pro goalie. It's just I think sometimes people forget just how hard it is for a six-foot goalie to be an impact goalie at the NHL level. It's You have to be unbelievable. Um, the other goalies, so Alexander Helnimo and Yurha Yakola, they fall into a similar categories. Both of them are overagers, though Yakola is older. Yakola played in Liga, which, again, I, going back to what I talked about with Raslav, with being dis uncomfortable, Liga is, is a kind of a strange league for goalies because sometimes he, these goalies end up with really low shot rates. Just There's not a lot of rubber coming their way. That's what happened to Yakola. There, there were games where he's only facing 20 shots on average for long stretches. So uh, for me, that makes my life more difficult. Uh, when you look at Yakola, smart, poised, calm, controlled, uh, doesn't doesn't allow himself to be beat on the first on the first shot too often. He doesn't throw himself out of position. The problem is goes back to kind of what I said about Ratzlaff, but actually further back than Ratzlaff when you project him long term, and that's the extension rates, the reflexes, the the athleticism below the the minimum threshold. Alexander Hell Nemo is a very similar circumstance. I'll try to keep this as short as possible. I feel like he's like Alex Nedeljkovic a bit. Alex Nedeljkovic was a goalie that actually burned me in the past. I thought he would be a minimum threshold type of goalie back then. I don't think that anymore. So I had to up it. And that's because, and that's why Alexander Hell Nemo ultimately uh, didn't make our list. So I, I, I apologize, Connor. I know that you wanted to get those, uh, read those players in the book, but there's only so many players we can write up. And we try to really focus on the ones that we really know we want to rank. And, th and that's why we had to leave them out this year. Good enough. Um, I think um, we'll just try and pour through these and I'm going to direct uh, where I can probably to, since I'm going to kind of act as the plan was to try and act as a host and I'll chime in where I can, but I'll direct where I can to you guys, unless it's just more of a an Ontario guy that I obviously saw more than you guys. So, which is the case for the next thing. And we just got a comment and it was kind of bonk and count in the first round you know kind of like questioning that so i didn't even i've been busy all day today guys i didn't even see uh where bob had bonk but i always assume he's probably in that top 32 um yeah, yeah. and i have no idea where he has cowan but um i'll quickly i'll quickly just kind of say that i think i think bonk 
has a lot of room uh, left to, to give. He's he's just scratching the surface. Uh, physically, he's kind of, um, although he's a big kid, there's a lot of room for him to grow, get bigger, stronger. Uh, but the hockey sense is really strong. He doesn't make many mistakes out there on the ice. He was a key piece of a team that went to the OHL final, logging huge minutes against the other team's best. Uh, there's just so much uh, upside left to come with him. And then Cowan is a real energy player. But the thing about Cowan is it's it's at another level of, of energy to the point of almost being like he's he's one of those pests. And then he's got hockey sense to go along with it. So we think he can play with elite players. In other words, he can play on one of the top two lines with the best the NHL has to offer because he's smart enough to play the game with them. Skill level would just be like a six. He, he's not a, a super talented player that's going to blow you away with his skill, but he's also not stone hands. This is not a player that is, is not capable of uh, putting points on the board and scoring himself. And he goes to the dirty areas all that kind of good stuff. So he's it's harder to find these guys these days, the, the, the guys that kind of do some of the dirty work for the really talented, skilled guys on their line. And whether he ends up being a top two line guy, which we think he's capable of, or possibly, you know, going up and down three lines, um, I think his stock went up as the season went along. He had a very good playoff. He just got more confident. This is a player that didn't even play in the league last year. So he was a rookie. And he was number one PK, all situations. Dale Hunter put him on. Last two minutes of a one-goal lead. Last two minutes if they're trailing uh, by a goal. He played in all situations with total confidence of Dale Hunter. And I've seen that before with guys like Bo Horvat, uh, Evangelista, who just got his taste of the NHL this past year. So that's really a quick uh, synopsis. Um I know that uh, both Jerome and Brad were not as high as Bonk as I was at the start of the year, but both of them warmed to him as the season went along. So I'll just quickly let you guys chime in here if you want. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Um, yeah, definitely Bonk was probably like like the most fun debate player we had uh, during the season. Um, but like you got, you have to give credit to the, to him. Like he made some really some good uh some good progress over the year over the season like for, if you look at where he was like in august at the Olympic tournament to what he did in the playoff for london this, that's that's a huge you know uh progression for him and then colin is a guy i didn't know much about coming into the year you know um and but like he plays the way i feel like he's a hockey prospect type of player like we, we love like those kind of uh, energy smart player and um, yeah, again like if you look at where he was in October November to what he did in the playoff for London like that's like one thing we talk we talk often about is uh, the progression curve um, and you want to see guys get better as the each month of the season goes by and um, like those two guys really improved during the year and um, yeah I'm um, I'm I'm, I was a big fan of them, like, um, late in the season. And, uh, you know, that's a big reason why they're in their, in their top three, too. Yeah, they're, they're both players. The, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? They're, they're not um, going to end up on highlight reels too often. They just go about their business the right way. And those are still important players. They're just more scouts players as opposed to, you know, uh, type of players that people love to to bring up and talk about the dynamic aspect. It's that's not what they're for. They're they're much more based around just how intelligent they are. And I, I guess the last thing I'll say is I think the big thing with Cowan's game is that I, I felt like the skating came around. That was that was a big part, uh, especially later in the season. Once that happened, you start seeing him take over uh, at a higher rate and obviously produce in the playoffs. I think that's one of the main reasons why. The skating actually really came along. Both both players it did. Bonk, not to the same level of improvement as as Cowan, though. Okay, next up, the draft depth. We get questions on this year. I think a lot of people went into this season thinking that it was going to be the draft of all drafts, super draft. Um, and really, you know, if you want to listen to us, we don't really think it is. So, Jerome, why don't you uh, just address quickly 
um, we got a kind of a only 19 A players uh, comment thrown our way. Um, so just quickly um, address that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it goes with what we said We said all year. We didn't think this was like a, a, fant a fantastic draft. We didn't think it was 2003, not 2015. Like still like a decent to good draft. Um, if you compare to last year, I believe we had 22A or 23A. So that speaks for itself, I guess, um, with, with only 19 this year. And, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, let's say the second third of the first round like we have to rank them there but like we're, we're not like huge you know crazy fan of them either so a lot of them have like can talk about sally or you know any anyone in the 2032 range that you know uh have, they have flaw and there's some stuff that they do don't that we don't like um so um so yeah like we we can we try to have more A, but we're just not gonna put a A rated player just for the, the sake of it. So, and as far as like the depth, um, like it's a weird draft, honestly. Like I feel like from the let's say the top fifteen, we're pretty happy with it, and then it goes it goes down after that. But then later in the draft, like late, for late picks, there's a lot of guys that we we like as potential late picks, but um like the let's say the middle of the draft the middle of our list it's very like average i would say yeah i was talking to uh i'll call it a decision maker scout last week uh who thinks it's a terrible draft um i mean basically making it look like we love it compared to what he thought but then the week before that talked to another a scout who actually thinks it's a uh, much better draft than we do so there's obviously always going to be a variance of opinions. Um, I, I was saying, I can't remember who I was saying it to recently when I was talking to someone last week, but not the best A group. I mean, obviously at the top, there's some fantastic players, but the A group kind of drops off quick. Even the guys we have as some of our A, a our, our later, you know, guys that are have the A grade or not maybe as strong an A grade as some previous drafts. But I kind of like the B group, and the B group I think went deeper than some drafts. So high end A's probably not as good, but maybe a little bit better B group than some drafts. Brad, ten seconds. <laughs> uh, top four is elite. Five to twelve is very good. Uh, once you get to like sixteen forty, I think there's the most risk I've ever seen in the B range. And then when you get from forty one to about sixty one, it picks back up. And then uh, does anybody really care after that? <laughs> And just so everybody knows, this is what we have to do in meetings where we'd have 18 hour meetings. <laughs> but Brad on a time limit. Okay, next question. Uh, Brad, you're going to get this, so you're going to get to talk. Uh, surprised, to to see, surprised to see Salah solo. We'll start with you on this, Brad. Yeah, don't be surprised. Um, so, okay, this is a player who was really interesting and intriguing last season. That said, I went back and watched him in uh, Cheche U20 in his league play, and then he became more underwhelming. I was like, this is interesting. He was very good at the U18s. He's pretty good internationally. And you see him in league play, and it's like, oh, there's more of a spectrum with this player than we, we expected. Head into the season, I think he ended up in the same situation as Lucas Raymond, meaning Lucas Raymond was not ready for the SHL. He should have been in El Svenskin. He wasn't. What did we get? We got some poor performances that made us have more questions than answers. He falls in a similar category, but he's not as talented as Raymond. The other aspect of this is Lucas Raymond performed extremely well internationally prior to his actual draft season. Uh, you could make a lot of discussions about where he was in that season within his actual performances, but you cannot make the same discussion with Shala. We felt Edward Shala was downright miserable internationally this season. So when you look at it from a perspective of he was supposed to be the guy for Chechia and he wasn't, okay, well, we have to go back to league play. Well, he's playing in Chechia, as I mentioned, extra league. So that means we have to be careful with him, right? He's at a disadvantage. He's not finished with his growth. He's, he's kind of similar to not as – this is an extreme example, but for us, we just talked about Oliver Bonk. There's a lot of growth rate left with Bonk. We feel there still is left with Shala too, and that's why we had to be careful. Uh, not as much with Bonk, but still there. 
The problem is when you look at his skill set, there are missing components completely that you still need to see. So, for instance, one thing he basically doesn't do, he's basically what he is right now is a power play option who off looks a lateral pass from the circle and finds options. Or he's a player who out of nowhere has a nice handling play, maintains or gain, gains inside positioning and finds himself a, a beautiful catch and release lateral setup. That's, that's about what he is. That's not a whole lot to gauge right now. You factor in the compete level being all over the map. And you factor in the fact that even though his A to B is exceptional at times, his mechanics aren't very good. And why does that matter to us? Because of posture. If he's, if he's not on balance, if he doesn't have the posture you typically want to see, it means when he is attempting to handle, when he's attempting to drive play, it's going to break down. So right now he looks like a complimentary player with a tremendous amount of talent at times, but it's more flashes than consistent. And because of that, we felt less confident. That's why I moved him down our list. Jerome, 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, one of the shocking thing about Sally all years is how much praise he got for his international tournament all year long. And every time we talk, like the three of us, we didn't like any of his tournaments. Um, if you look at his the stats, like, like his stats are not like terrible in international tournament, but a lot of points are against really bad team. Um, so. If you look at the World Junior, I think he had six points in seven games, but I think he had four points against Germany. Yeah. Or I, one of the I, weaker, weaker team. I still cut him a little bit of slack there just because he's an underager in the U20. It's not a U18. Um, well, I but mean, then the same, but, the same thing happened at the Olinka and the same thing happened at yes. the U18. Five Nations, U18s. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it's I, a similar, similar. Yeah, as yeah. we all agreed all year. But I do think the U20 is a little bit different animal to cut him a little bit more slack. That's all. Yeah, okay, that's, that's next fine. up is uh, Richie and Muskie in the top 20. Um, so I think it was just a quick, you know, comment on that. Yeah, really talented, uh, went one and two in the OHL draft. Um, really, it's, it's, it's two interesting stories here because Musty at his best is probably a top 10 pick, uh, but he wasn't at his best nearly as often as you would want to see. So it was... It was compete level consistency issues. Uh, I saw him be very good, and I saw him where, I mean, you, you just don't even know if you would want to pull the trigger in the second round. Um, so he's one of those guys where it makes it a little more challenging when you just don't see that consistency. And then Richie is a smart player. He's got skill. He's got that size you want. Um, but Richie was playing injured all year. So it makes it really challenging in your draft year to be at your best when you're playing with an injury. Um, so he managed to stay, I think we got him uh, 18, 17, 18, I can't remember, uh, but just inside that top 20. And I think Musty's just right there with him. So really tight in the end, <laughs> excuse me. I saw them uh, play a lot. Um, for the for the the consistency issue of a musty, it makes him a little more more challenging. I'll be interested to see uh, where he goes off the board. And then Richie was a tough evaluation because you're watching a player struggling through an injury that finished with, you know, re-injuring it in the uh, the U18 in April. Either um, of you guys? Yeah, yeah, I'll just mention on Richie. He was probably the toughest evaluation I had this year. Um either like with Oshawa or like internationally, like the injury factor was, was, uh, was there. Um, but I don't know. I, he was one of the toughest, uh, player I had to, to scout this year. I didn't, I, I really didn't know what to think, but I really liked him last year. Like I saw him, he had the, this, uh, Aki Canada event in Ottawa last year for the U17 and he was a top three player at this, at that event. So, um, but this year was like, and he was healthy there. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was, it was really hard for me to scout this year. Yeah. Brian, yeah, I'll, I'll just finish. Yeah, I'll finish just by saying like th these two players almost like uh, encompass the entire draft for us in a way. Really talented. And in Musty's case, very raw. And then in in Richie's case, we have to take in variables that you don't want to. And that that kind of sums up the whole B range of this class. Right? You look at, again, you look at that 16 to 40 range, some of these kids are unbelievably talented, 
right? Don't get us wrong. But you look at the variables you have to take into consideration. Usually you don't want to, you don't have to. And that, that's where, that's what makes this draft intriguing, but dangerous. And uh, so that, that's what I'll end on with both of them. Yeah, just a few extra warts on some players this year compared to some other years, um, especially in the the top 32, which goes back to what we we're talking about, about how many A players and the depth and strength and that sort of thing. Okay, um, a comment, not as high as uh, Sandin Pelica as others. Jerome, um, you and I talked about this guy quite a bit, especially late. So why don't you start with this one? Yeah. Well, a pretty simple answer, simple, simple answer. Uh, we don't really project him as a PP1 guy. And then as a 5'10", 5'11", defenseman, he does, that makes him less like appealing for us. Um, not much of a, like he does has like some struggle to defend. Um, and then like the physicalities, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. And, um, so his projection becomes like very, it's tough to rank him in too high in a draft. And then, you know, if you look at the NHL, like the NHL playoffs, there's not many guys that succeed that looks like him. Um, one guy we really all, Mark, Brad, we love was Nils Lundqvist. Um, and then like both, both players are very like similar size, very smart. And we, I think we both like Lundqvist better than Pelika, and Lundqvist didn't get a single shift in the playoff for for Dallas. So it makes the projection of Pelika a bit tricky, um, and and so yeah, that's why he's a bit later in the the top three two for us. Brad, real quick. There's two component, like there's two players. Uh, when you when you look at uh, any player in this draft, there, there's two ways to look at them. Are, are they a playoff contributor? Or are they a regular season contributor? Are they both, right? That's when you look podcast. at a smaller <laughs> <laughs> on itself, when you look at a player like Axel Sand and Pelica, we feel he falls into the uh, regular season category more than the playoff category. And that for us right there is a, is a reason to drop him. The other factor is you look at the top four right now. We, you know, I know some of you probably think we're dinosaurs. We get it. We're a bit older, but we do try to look uh, and adapt. Uh, and one thing that we noticed was in the playoffs, you look at the top four teams that, that made it to the semifinals into the cup. Only one of those teams had um, three six foot player, uh, I think it was four actually defensemen. There were six feet or under. However, look at Brandon Montour and Radko Gudis's hit rates. Right, you're talking about really tenacious defense. You look at Axel Sand and Pelica goes back to what Jerome just said. Uh, not the most tenacious defender. Too much of a one gear pace sometimes. Too calculated when sometimes he needs to really just increase his gear. For us, that's a huge component. We really care about pacing with smaller defensemen. He didn't always match the pace necessary. Yeah, I, I I got a text last week from a scout who really liked the ranking and then and then the you know our take on him and basically we're on the same page because it was like the player like he's a smart player very very few mental mistakes during the game but not a fantastic defender matched with the size and then when you start having question marks about whether or not he can be a power play guy in the nhl you know which is much different getting to the nhl and i mean i remember just watching how long it took for ryan ellis to get on the power play in the friggin nhl and he lit up the, the canadian hockey league so it's it's not like it's uh you know we don't appreciate the good parts of this player i had some brandstrom brandstrom flashbacks and you know at, at moments too which you know there's limitations there as well so a player that appreciate his good stuff but some of the stuff we don't like is kind of damaging for us when it comes to the you know the end of the year and doing the ranking okay next up uh why so high on barlow so this this is an interesting one because, um, and we can probably all talk about how tight it really was, kind of between that four to eleven or that that general area in there, uh, where really about as tight. Would you guys agree about as tight as we've ever had in our meetings for the last you know the last meetings trying to decide four to eleven? I don't remember one where we had to debate as much and and really you know on a different day or or if somebody's making an argument it's it's hard to argue against some of the other guys but barlow um ended up being what we think is just a safe pick because he's 
He's pretty polished. I think Barlow could probably, I wouldn't do this because I don't like rushing anybody, but I think Barlow could play in the NHL next year. He's an extremely competitive player. He's smart. Uh, skill. The shot is ridiculous. And when we matched up with the other guys up there, and this the list changed throughout the year. He wasn't always our number six. But in the final list, it was kind of like, who do you, you know, who are we going to feel good about going home with that six pick and and really be able to sleep well and not worry too much that that we're, you know, picking the, the one possible bust. And Barlow kind of fits that bill as the hockey player. We talk about that, you know, are you drafting for regular season or playoffs? I think a lot of scouts are starting to talk about this where you almost have to have split your draft and some are regular season guys, some are, are playoffs because it's hard to find the guys that are both uh, or tons of them. And I think Barlow is a both. I think he'll be a, a good regular season performer and 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 not disappear in the playoffs. So real quick, you two guys, I know Brad, you're you're also a big fan of Barlow for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it really short. I, there are so many players that showed up and down seasons all over the map. You, you, you go right through it, right? And Colby Barlow wasn't one of them. This time. So he was actually very consistent with what he is. He's a player who already understands what he is and what he has to do. And I know for some of you, it's like, well, he's not very creative. He's not a dual threat, right? He's not, not a primary playmaker like he is a natural shooter. Well, what I say to that is not every player has to be overly creative if you can't stop them. But you, it's very hard to stop Colby Barlow when he's going. He knows exactly what he needs to do. He's a beast on the ice, phenomenal shot. And uh, he's, he's one of those rare player types where he, you know the throwbacks in him and, th and that's what you need in playoff time. He could be the very rare example what we talked about where he's both regular season and playoffs. And that's super rare in this class. So that's why we have him as high as we do. Yeah. And, you know, to show how tight it it was, I think it, it, we were just talking about that 4 to 11, 4 to 12, whatever, that range. Like it was tough for me at points of the season between deciding between a Leonard and Barlow. And then you look at our final final list and I think it's uh, Leonard 11 and Barlow six. So, you know, it was like an either or, who do you like better and humming and hawing. And then they're separated by five spots on the list. So just a little bit of a, a an example of how tight it was there. Uh, Jerome, anything real quick on Barlow? Uh, not really. I think you guys pretty much, you know, said it, everything that needs to be said about Barlow. Um, so I, great shot. I compete. Um, you know, I, I thought the skating was all year was, ah, uh, the skating, but then at the U18, the skating looked fine on, on big ice. So not much, no more worries about the skating, I think, from, from hockey prospects. <laughs> Okay, next up, you're going to talk anyway, Jerome. So we got this question. I've seen it on Twitter multiple times. HF boards and direct message to me and through our website. Are you worried about Simashev's production rate? <laughs> Jerome, I know uh, you can answer this. The question is no. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. Uh, no, I, I remember me and Brad were talking maybe December. And Simashev at one point in 15 games in MHL, and we didn't care. We love we loved the prospect, and we knew he was going to come at some point. MHL is just a weird – it's a weird league. Sometimes the stats don't really tell the whole story, but usually stats don't mean the whole story. But in this case, like I remember Dragicevic had crazy stats in the, in the WHL, and we're like usually – if you have a six foot two D that has like those type of stats that plays physical, that can, you know, play on the power play, you tend to really like those players. And we didn't really like him at that time. And then Simachev on the other end, one point in 15 games, but we didn't care. Like he, he has so much tools. And then like, we all, we always said like the offense is going to come and it, and, you know, he finished the year, I believe, with 17 points in 27 games. Uh, he was great in the playoff um, for Loco. Um, so, no, 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 no worries for me as far as, like, the offense. I mean, is he going to be Kale McCarr? No. Um, but he has so much tools and he has so much development ahead of him that I think he's going to be a really – Really, uh, really good defenseman at the NHL level and potential first pairing, you know, defenseman. Brad, 10 seconds. 
His production last year was really good for his minus one season. His production improved over the course of the season in the playoffs, as Jerome uh, spoke to. The other thing is when you look at him offensively, he's very similar to Tanner Molendyke, meaning they actually have the toolkit, the offensive skill set to break down the initial layer. They don't know what they're doing with the puck after that. Give them five years, they'll get there. Good job. That, I think you went a little over, but not too bad. Yeah, it, it just uh, I'll just finish by saying that uh, very different looking players for the first time I viewed them. Um, uh, but uh, Heiskanen I saw in North Dakota as uh, a U, he was U17 at the time. He was about 5'10", 150 pounds. I am not comparing the players, but one thing when I first laid eyes on Simashev that reminded me of Heiskanen was just the the poise just it just jumped out like I just it reminded me of watching Heisken and the very first time I ever saw Heisken and was just that poise so not comparing the players but comparing just the poise uh, when I first viewed both prospects and they looked a lot different size wise because Heisken and hadn't grown yet okay um the next question is Gabe Perot uh why is he higher than Benson Brad go to you on this I feel, I feel like uh, Gabe Pro might be one of the most underrated players I can ever remember. He, did, he just broke the program record. He's unbelievably dynamic. One of the smartest players in the draft. The, the big weakness for him is the skating base. And he, I thought he improved over the course of the season. He generated more power by the end of the, the year to help compensate. Um, he reminds me a ton. I've said this a, a couple of times already, but I'll, I'll mention it at the end of the season here. I watched a lot of Andre Kuzmenko on the SK system because Kromarchenko was there and a couple of other prospects that we – we were high on and wanted to, to watch the development. He is basically an American Andre Kuzmenko that is a heck of a top line complimentary piece that can do a lot for your team and put at least 70, 70 plus points up on the on the board. The reason Zach Benson's a bit low, we love Zach Benson. Okay, that's uh, the reason we have Zach Benson lower is uh, all three. Jerome, me and Jerome have conversations like uh, about this in the past. Mark and myself uh, recently had an in-depth conversation that we, we discussed in the Black Book a bit, and that's that when you are monitoring and evaluating smaller players that are extremely competitive, you absolutely must take into consideration the fact that they're very likely to end up on the IR at a higher rate. Uh, you saw it last year with Frank Nazar. We actually discussed that in the book. We, we, one of my quotes in the black book was say, be ready for Frank Nazar to get injured because the way that he plays and the size he is, is a recipe for injury. Zach Benson was injured in the playoffs already uh, this past season. And when we saw that, his game did slow down dramatically. Uh, we have, Mark has, was uh, always discussed with me, Robbie Fabry. Another great example of a player who never looked right. He's never looked the same since his injuries. Victor Arvidsson, Tyler Johnson. The list goes on of fantastic, brilliant, small players that once they get injured, it either takes them time to come back or they don't come back uh, and be the same player they used to be. Jerome, anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, it's just it's just very close, man. Like uh, the like the four, four, five to 13 range is like incredibly tight and like, Perro just got better and better and better and better as the season went along. And you can make a case he's the smartest player in the whole draft. So um, the skating is, it's fine. Like he gets to point A to point B, fine. So no no issue there. And he competes hard too. Like um, I would say he competes harder than let's say his, his standard, Will Smith. Um, and he has a better two-way game. And I think there's just less question mark next to his name than Benson and as as good as Benson is the 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 size the the frame just the injury concern is a it's a bit too much question mark compared to to peril yeah and again to show how tight this is I think we had Benson five or six in January okay so <laughs> this is not like we're we're Benson haters this is a player we really like but it was tough to rank this group. It was really tight in this in this little group of players here. Um, next question: Any personal favorite prospects here? I'll start because I can go really quick because I've already talked about them. And it was Cowan in London. I did something I don't know if I've ever done. I threw on extra games of Cowan because I just loved watching him play. So I'd pull up a game on Instat and take the 18 minutes to watch an extra game I didn't need to watch. I mean, I knew this player. At this point, I knew his game uh, inside out, uh, but I just liked watching him play. Just I just love the player that just brings that 
that compete level to another level. He had that little intangible, you cannot teach a player either has it or he doesn't. Uh, my friend is is Denver Barkey's billet. Uh, Barkey and Cowan are, are really good friends. So I know the kid is a good kid because he was around my buddy all the time. So there's no off ice concerns there at all. Um, and my buddy couldn't rave about both those players anymore if he tried. Uh, just fantastic kids, which is always nice to hear. Uh, matching talent on the ice. Uh, so yeah, Cowan is, is my favorite. There's others, but I'll leave that as, as mine. Brad, why don't you, uh, you got you got one that stands out. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot, but I'll, I'll mention one that I'm like kind of amazed by with where they're ranked to public. I really hope this sits for me because if it doesn't, I'm looking bad. Uh, Alexander Rykov. Alexander Rykov blew me away in the VHL. Some of his peak performances were, yeah, you're, you heard this right, better than Matthew Mishkov's. Um, he's extremely well-rounded. I'm not saying that he's going to be better than Matthew Mitchkov. Everybody calm down. I'm just saying. Some of his performances are better. Um, fantastic 200-foot game. Extremely intelligent player. Everybody talks about how there's a limited ceiling. He broke the VHL record for points uh, in that league for any player that isn't Valerian Nechushkin who played 15. Any player that played 20 games plus, he broke the record for. When you look at his offensive ability, yeah, he's not a high-end goal scorer by any stretch. He has excellent set of hands. He's a very good playmaker, very intelligent player. Understands how to use pick and roll options. Unlike players like Will Smith, who are right at the top of this class, this kid is fantastic with his physical instincts. Understands how to reverse hit to create space for himself. Understands how to utilize pick and roll options in advanced level to create more space. There is a ton there. I am amazed where he is on list. I really honestly feel like this is the last Matthew Nyes we had. We're kind of living on an island. We had him in the top uh, 12, I believe, or top 11. Everybody uh, came at us thinking that that was way too high, and we're feeling pretty good about that. I, I feel like Alex Rykov, we're the only staff that has him top. I believe we have him 28th. Uh, hopefully that hits for us, but I, I really believe in that player. Jerome, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, so I might swing you off, but... <laughs> So is it is it not Simashev? <laughs> well, yes, it is. Uh, Why don't you talk about Boot? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was going to mention Boot player because they both play on the same team, and the, the reason is pretty simple. The projection, and they're a very unique type player. You just, like, how many times can you find a six foot four D that skates like Simashev, can handle the puck like he does? Like, you talk about, like, he, he reminds you of, like, Ice Cannon. Like, I can say his hands reminds me of Simon Edvinson. Um, also, the lack of shooting also reminds me of Simon Edvinson, by the yeah, way. Yeah, the weakness of his game. Uh, yeah. And, you know, defensively and, like, his athletic ability, it's very K. Andre Miller-like for me. So, I mean, that's <laughs> it's kind of like a wild bunch of comparables for him. And Daniel Butte, like, does not <laughs> – he's uh, – the projection, again, is super exciting – um he's six five he might be six six when he's done growing um so much growth in his game uh, the skating has come miles away since last year um and there's so much like he's still he's still like he looks he still looks like a baby uh, yeah so there's a lot of growth in his like he might be six six to twenty five in, in three four years um and he can play hockey like he's got really good hands the shot is kind of like Safkowski. sometimes it's really good sometimes it's kind of like uh, a bit off but you know he's he's gonna grow into his body like the coordination is gonna be, be be even better in, in the next few years so i'm just i just love both players and i i just i think the um the the projection but like I'm, they're a very unique player for the NHL. There's not many guys like that, too. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that he's he looks like a baby, and I think I said that about five times in our meetings because the kid's a monster, and he he, he does. He's still like a baby as far as his physical maturity. So uh, he is really going to be a monster as he uh, grows into his frame here and, and gets stronger. Okay. Um, is there anything that's changed uh, back in the ranks um, since the pandemic? I'll just quickly handle this one. Uh, it's pretty much back to normal, folks. Um, it was very interesting uh, during the pandemic, sitting in uh, you know ten thousand seat Budweiser Gardens in London with fourteen scouts, and we're just sitting scattered around Center Ice. 
uh, in an echoing rink uh, it was an interesting feeling. Um, but those days are, are thankfully behind us here. Although I did enjoy the parking uh, <laughs> when I was going to games and showing up a little later to the games. Uh, but yeah, those days are behind us. Pretty much back to normal. The only thing just a little bit different for me is I used to go to pretty much everything. So like a Tuesday night in Kitchener where it was two teams where there re really wasn't a player on either team I needed to see or or we didn't have even as a C-rated prospect. I was going anyway. Um, I've kind of cut that out because just the costs that have gone up for gas and all that kind of thing, it would cost me $50 to go to the game. Meanwhile, scouts that are going, they're making their per diem. They're, they're, they're kind of making extra money going to the game. So while it was costing me 50, um, it wasn't costing obviously team scouts to go. Uh, so I just kind of cut those out. And with the use of, of us purchasing Instat now, which is our video software, which is fantastic. Um, on a night like that, if I stay home from, from going to the rink where there's, like I said, just really nobody I need to see in that game and spending money, I stay at home and, and catch up on some in-stat viewings and pick some players and pour through some videos. So it's it's more productive. It's more cost of effective for our limited budget. So really, you know, in summary, we're back to normal except some tweaks like that for us personally. But NHL team-wise, they're using video more absolutely positively. The pandemic changed that. Are they relying on solely video? No, it's an extra resource for them. Like it is for us, we still like the live stuff. There's no substitute. But for us, it's it's kind of cutting out some unnecessary viewings for NHL teams. They're now using Instat or whatever uh, software they're choosing to. Uh, next question. Um, anyone who will get drafted uh, much earlier or later than people expect. So I can use the same player again. I'm going to say Cowan. Uh, I don't know where he's going to go. I think there's a slim chance very late first, but I think he'll be gone by the middle of the second for sure. And I'm not, I haven't looked at a ton of lists lately, but I don't think I've seen much of his name at all, let alone predicting he's going to be gone by the middle of the second round. Do you guys have, have one? Top your yeah, head. Yeah. Um, I'll. I mean, I might stole one from Brad, so Brad, don't <laughs> don't get mad at me here. But I'm gonna go with Damian Clara. Um, I didn't. I think his name doesn't get much respect on public public list, but I think he's a top four round easily pick for me. Um, and I've seen his name on other lists really late or not at all. So um, really like this goalie. Huge. Um, Top five, I would put him in my top five as far as like pure athlete of the draft. Um, and uh, yeah, that'd be my guy. I think we'll, he will go a lot higher than people think. I don't think he'll get to the fourth. Brad, your your guy? He stole it. Jerome stole my guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. um, to Jerome's point, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, generalize this to the goalies in general. I think these goalies are going to go higher than people think. And the reason why is usually what happens with the staff is they really fall in love with a specific player. And when you see one go, guess what happens? The domino effect starts and they say, get that guy now, especially with teams with multiple picks. And there are a lot of teams that need goalies that have multiple picks. So uh, you look at Crabble, you look at Damian Clara, you look at Adam Guyan, you look at those players. Those are unique goalies that are hard to get in organizations. When one goes, I'm willing to bet that a lot of teams will step up and, and move quickly on the goalie front. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, as you guys know, I, I haven't loved some of the goalie classes in recent years, but I, I like a few of the guys in this class. I like the guys that aren't all robot-like, and the two you guys just singled out there, uh, they're very athletic and not, uh, they've got the structure in their game, but there's a little bit of athlete and just do what you got to do to stop the puck mixed in, which I like, some creativity, I'll call it. Um, next up is... Uh, what players did, did your team, as in Hockey Prospect, have the widest range of opinions on? Uh, was anyone uh, on Danielson, Jaeger, and more? Um, in other words, was anybody different on those? So uh, I did some real quick research on this because I, I didn't have much time. But we've got... Um, um, we've got... 
I don't think there was a big difference of opinion on those three players just off the hop, eh, guys? No, no. I yeah. think we see him similar. Um, so, so one is Brindley. Both uh, our scouts in the U.S., Dustin and Mike Farkas, were higher on Brindley uh, than where he came in on our list at 51. Uh, so that is one for sure. Uh, Dusty also had Strammel as his second ranked player in his area. I got to tell people to stress too. He didn't have Strammel second overall. This is his area. He's our Minnesota high school guy who also got out. He's in Wisconsin. So Strammel's on his list and he had Strammel too. And, uh, and uh, Brindley number three on his list. Anything I'm forgetting here, guys, that I, I can't think of a whole ton that we were crazy well, different. Brad had a couple. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you one that I'm like, oh, I think it's going to bite us. Um, Lenny Hamino. I think I think Lenny's going to gonna bite us. He's, he's a guy I have in the 40s. I think Lenny plays. I get it, though. It's like, well, what is he? Oh, he's a depth version of Radifax. He put on a wing. I mean, it's not, the most, it's not the most exciting projection, but I really think he plays, and I really think there's a little more on tap there uh, just because he played the league the whole season. So offensively, I think there's a bit more there. Um, but in terms of, like, what we look for, like very intelligent player. Do you know, he's not so dissimilar, uh, just, just for our listeners, there's some similarities to Easton Cowan. Uh, this is a 200 foot player, incredibly intelligent, not a gifted offensive player. So there, there is some overlap there. And I, I tried to fight a little bit for it, but uh, I, I feel like maybe he, he was one that stands out. We had had enough of Brad at that point of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome, do you have anything real quick or forget in here? Yeah. Like a real standout one? Well, I think like in the first half of the season, our, our discussion about Oliver Bonk were pretty entertaining. We should have re record those, to be honest. Um, but like uh, Mark was really I just thought of him. one. <laughs> yeah, Mark was really high, high on him. Brad, not so much. I wasn't like in the middle between the two of them. So there was some good debate going on with Oliver Bonk. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, Oliver Bonk is the guy, first guy that came up to me. To my to my mind when I saw that that question. Okay, so Jerome just uh, jarred my memory. Uh, we really fought about this player, but I just ended the arguments by saying I'm going to wait till the end of the year before I really battle. And this was Andrew Crystal. Uh, the two other guys on the screen here absolutely love this player, and uh, I did not. And it wasn't because I didn't love parts of his game. There's parts of his game that are incredible, but we disagreed. Uh, on the skating and how hard that was going to uh, hurt him. And I think Brad cooled on some other parts of his game too. And I'm going to let him speak here, but yeah, Andrew Crystal was one that, that uh, I was kind of like, I'll just wait till the end of the year and I'll, I'll go to battle at the end. And as I think I said in the black book, I was on an Island by myself. And by the end of the year, my Island was uh, more populated. So I didn't have to go to battle, but Brad, just real quick. Cause I know you kind of cooled on him maybe in, some other areas than other than just kind of changing your thoughts on the skating. Yeah, it, for me, it was it was one of those factors where he okay, the toolkit's bad, right? But at least in my initial viewings, he was competitive. He 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 didn't get the results he wanted, but he was competitive. For instance, he wouldn't just battle; he would he would really attack players and usually get pushed around and usually lose pop battles. But he would be competitive. In other moments, he would take a hit to make a play and successfully bounce back up, and and his game wouldn't die down. By the by, towards the middle point of the season, into the playoffs, and uh, when I saw him live there at the U18s, I felt like his the, the competitive nature of the kid it was just not there. Um, so once the consistency of his compete died down for me, you factor in the skating base, it really uh, messed up my initial uh, projection of him in a huge way. Definitely definitely made me more aware of his faults and just uh, the limitations in this game. Yeah, and it's why we watch all season long and not little two-week windows or, or just close the book on a player. Jerome, any two cents, Dad? Not really. Okay. <laughs> uh, just... Speed along. Very, very tough second half for him. Got hurt, and like the skating never really improved, and his compete level also was quite like very good early on, and then it just, it just became pretty average. So a lot of question mark next to his name. That's why he's, he's pretty late on our list. Okay, next question: Who are some of the most NHL ready players? 
I don't like rushing anybody, but I, I would say for me off the top of my head is, is Barlow, which I kind of mentioned earlier. He's, you know, he's closer to what he's going to be already. There were jokes in the rink all year long. Like, you know, he, he he's looking pretty good for a 29 year old. Cause he just looked, you know, uh, so old for his age as a, as opposed to some kids, uh, you know, that are just like still have the baby face sort of thing. So I think Barlow, um, and I wouldn't rush him, uh, definitely would not rush him but i think barlow if if push came to shove could could probably be uh, a reasonably uh, effective player and wouldn't hurt you if he played next year yeah, yeah. um i mean obviously the bedar carlson fantilli they're like the easy one i i i honestly i would like carlson to play another year in the shl if i was just me um but uh, i think fantilli that doesn't really have much left to prove in college you know, best player in college hockey in, in his freshman year. So I would definitely have him play NHL. If not, you, you can send him to the American Hockey League by, you know, you're allowed to do it. So, but other than the top three and Barlow, I don't, I don't know if anyone is really going to ch challenge for playing in the NHL next season. Brad, two cents. Yeah, I, I'm with you guys. I, I can't think off the top of my head a player where I'd be like, oh, I'm comfortable with him. That's not in the top three, you know, and they, and I'm with Jerome. Why, why rush them? I'm with both of you. Why rush them? Leo Carlson, give him an extra year. Uh, Fintilli definitely doesn't need to be in college anymore, but I don't think he's NHL ready either. Um, I mean, he's probably the most NHL ready though. I would argue the most just because of the physical nature of him, like compared yeah. to Bedard. Like I know Bedard's a beast, a physical specimen in his own right, but he's still smaller. So, you know, the last class, I think, you know, it's funny, ended up, I think it was Janice Jeromoza that ended up getting the most time, right? So who would have predicted that? But it, it's one of those situations where this draft is very raw. And because of that, it's very unlikely to see a, a certain player that could really uh, uh, make it full time. Yeah, I, I just I just always think that you don't lose waiting the extra year. You know, like you, you just don't. You look at you look at um, some players in the past that just took that extra year, or and people thought they're going to make it, and then they went back, and it didn't hurt them. Yeah, they might pour some numbers in junior and and look like they're dominating, but you know, there's a lot of people to say I want to see them dominate in their current league before they move on. Absolutely destroy their current current league before we bring them up. So there's all kinds of trains of thought on that. I just don't think you ever lose uh, waiting over rushing. Um, obviously there's, there's guys that have gone right in and done very well, but there's, there's plenty that haven't. So, uh, but, but in general, this draft is not st stacked with, I don't, I think we're all in agreement, not stacked with a whole bunch of, of NHL easy, easy to name NHL ready guys. Um, and last question, how did goalies in this draft compare to other drafts? I just jumped on it to mention real quickly for me, I like this. I like this draft compared to some recent drafts for sure. Uh, Brad, I'll let you expand on this a little bit. Well, last year's class was like the worst ever. I mean, it was really bad. So it, it, because of that, I usually expect a rebound, and that's basically what happened. This, this is a pretty good class. There's no standout, you know, Yaroslav Askarov, Spencer Knight type. And admittedly right now, Sebastian Kosa, all of them in redrafts probably moved back a little bit. So I think teams are going to be even more careful about uh, accelerating or going that high on a, on a, on a goalie. Um, that said, I'll, I'll say this. I don't think two of our goalies are going to be ranked or are going to be drafted this season. We rank them anyways because we think they'll be drafted next season. That's Igor Yagorov out of Dynamo System. And um, oh, who's the last one? Um, he plays an SKA. I can't remember off the top of my head. Go find him in the book. He's 6'5", plays an SKA system. You got Pavel Moisevic. I got it. Pavel <laughs> Moisevic. I found him. Pavel Moisevic uh, is a very intriguing goalie who reminds me a lot of a Russian version of Akira Schmid. Um, he was so good at the start of the season that SK's uh, uh, main team actually brought him in. That's usually a good sign. When an elite development system, an elite team with real money uh, finds a kid who is playing well against them and brings him in, that usually means that the, the staff thinks uh, highly of him. Um, so Pavel Moisevich is definitely the dark horse for me of this class. I have no idea if he's going to get drafted. Uh, if he doesn't, though, watch for him next season. Okay, well, that's all the questions uh, on our list, and we've gone for quite a while here. Uh, 
want to thank everybody that has purchased the book or or joined at the start of the year, our memberships, our platinum membership, however you supported us, thanks. We can't do this without you. Want to thank our scouts that are not on the screen right now. We're recording this during the day. Uh, they're at their uh, quote unquote real jobs, uh, so they're not with us, but uh, they work their their butts off. And uh, obviously to, to Brad and Jerome here, uh, thanks as well. Uh, we're going to go into slight summer mode after the draft. I just got notified by Marriott today saying uh, prepare for your trip. So it was a quick reminder that we're days away uh, from Nashville here. Uh, and other than that, anything I'm forgetting, guys, that we just quickly want to mention other than buy our stuff? Um, not that I can think of. Um, so, Brad... <laughs> Sure. I uh, just want to thank everybody on HF boards that helped support us and ask us questions. Um, your feedback's really important to us. Uh, it's important for you guys to be constructively uh, critical at times to make sure we give you the best product. I uh, just want to say thanks to our staff, uh, this black book. I, I know it comes out every year. You wouldn't believe the amount of effort behind the scenes to get this thing up and running. Not, not one of us has a bit of sleep for three to four weeks. It's very difficult uh, uh, to come to the public. Uh, just thank everybody who supports it. It means a lot to us and uh, look forward to seeing a lot more in the future from us. Yeah, I got, I was within arm's reach here. So here's the uh, hardcover edition, which I really, uh, this is new this year. It really turned out nice. You can see here. So I was uh, pretty impressed with this. Even the, the feel of the cover is, is really impressive. So for those of you that uh, ordered the hardcover, if it hasn't arrived yet, I think you're gonna be pretty, pretty happy. Anyway, thanks everybody. Enjoy the draft. Um, I think Brad has some goalie audio coming uh, that we'll have up before the draft. And other than that, we'll, you know, follow us on Twitter. We'll be tweeting and uh, basically preparing for uh, the next year's draft, which um, we've got a top 32 in the book there with some quick, quick looks of that. All right. Thanks everybody.